You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Bitcoin, Ether, Solana, Doge, and more. Cryptocurrencies and digital assets are taking the financial world by storm. This exploding market provides everything a savvy trader needs. Volatility, volume, and liquidity, provided you know how to find it. That's where we come in. Welcome to the Crypto Rundown. Each week, we'll break down the latest trading activity, trends, and developments throughout the world's leading crypto derivatives markets. If it's moving the crypto markets, then you'll find it on The Crypto Rundown. The Crypto Rundown is brought to you by Amber Data. If you're entering the digital asset class, you'll need access to granular on-chain and market data from multiple venues to power research, trading, risk management, and compliance. Amber Data delivers comprehensive data and insights into blockchain networks, crypto markets, and decentralized finance, empowering financial institutions to apply traditional finance methods to digital assets. Amber Data eliminates the infrastructure setup, integration challenges, and maintenance headaches to access digital asset data, reducing cost and time to market to enter the digital asset class. Learn more and download their digital asset data guide at www.amberdata.io. Now it's time to dive into the exploding world of crypto derivatives. It's time for the Crypto Rundown. All right, everybody. That music means we are back once again here on the network time for the Crypto Rundown, the program where we go a little bit beyond our traditional stomping grounds. Not going to talk about your Apple, your Spy, your VIX options here on the show. No, we're going to go a little bit further afield, see what's percolating out there in the waters of ETH and Bitcoin, talk about the volume, the volatility, the skew, all that good stuff, and a whole bunch more. My name, of course, Mark Longo from the THE optionsinsider.com as well as from the network upon which so many of you are binging hope those of you who are here in the u.s had a great thanksgiving holiday having a good start to your trading week remember for those of you who are crypto native maybe not so fluent in a lot of the options lingo we throw around here on the network then make sure a you're not just listening to the crypto rundown subscribe to the full network Nearly a dozen programs coming at you, including some great educational content. Options Boot Camp, Options Playbook Radio, both will serve you well in getting you up to speed. So when you check out a show like this, you'll feel a little bit more comfortable. Then, of course, if you like what you hear, throw a star rating or review. This show's been around since 2018. Of course, it's still the newcomer to the network for me. The network, of course, next year will be 17 years. That's terrifying to say out loud. <laughs> so make sure you're listening to the full network. And then, of course, if you want to go above and beyond, you want to join us for Let's say great pro Q&A sessions where you pick the brains of some of the best minds in the world of options and derivatives and have them answer your questions, as well as, of course, our Options Oddities program where we break down all of the great unusual activity and get up to all sorts of fun and indeed no good. Only one place to go. Check all that out. Theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. The place to go to learn more as we go out to the crypto hot seat and see who's joining us on the program this week. Forget about cold storage. It's time to turn up the heat on thought leaders from the world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time to take their place on the Crypto Hot Seat. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Crypto Hot Seat, the portion of the program where we welcome on guests from the world of crypto derivatives and indeed beyond and proceed to pick their brains for the benefit of you, the listener. And today's guest is a newcomer. To the program and indeed to the network, he is Willis Croft, the Director of Partnerships and Business Development at Wintermute. Willis, 
Welcome to the Crypto Rundown program. Hey, Mark. Thanks so much for having me. Pleasure to be here. And Willis, as we are wont to do with all of our first timers here on the network, why don't you go ahead and give our audience a bit of an overview of your background in the world of crypto and indeed derivatives, as well as what it is you folks do over there at Wintermute. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as you said in the intro, I'm the director of business development at Wintermute, based in London. Um, the role is pretty varied. I mean, essentially anything that could potentially require external um, engagement um, is on the table for the BD team at Wintermute. But really the focus is twofold. Number one, it's on working with the projects that we are a uh, liquidity provider for. And number two, it's working with all of the trading counterparties that use us for liquidity and trade with us on a bilateral basis, both spot and derivatives as well. Um, in terms of Wintermute, very, very happy to give you an overview. So Wintermute is um, a crypto native trading firm, uh, but fundamentally our aim is to help drive innovation, improvement, anything that's possible because of blockchain and crypto. And you can really think about how we do this by splitting it into, into three buckets. So number one is liquidity provision. So we work with centralized and decentralized exchanges. We work with projects directly. And really the aim here is to populate order books, provide liquid markets, make it as frictionless as possible for others to, tra to trade. Um, generally, when we work with projects, it tends to focus on centralized exchanges, but we're actually very active in DeFi, have one of the biggest footprints in DeFi, um, and we support liquidity for a number of projects and protocols uh, in that space as well. On the OTC side, uh, Wintermute really started off providing electronic liquidity to a number of agency brokers, prime brokers, retail apps, um, aggregators, all of that type of counterparty. Now, clearly one of the great things that you can do in crypto is you can uh, follow the flow of funds on chain really easily, given it's pretty transparent, and people start to realize when they're trading through these aggregators or trading through these brokers who the end liquidity providers are, and so they start coming, coming to us directly. And we've seen huge growth um, in our OTC desk, both on the spot and derivatives side this year is I think combination of people figuring out that we're one of the key end liquidity providers in the space, but also we've decided to be a bit more vocal with um, exactly what we what we offer. Um, and we onboarded our thousand OTC counterparty this year, which gives you some kind of context of the scale of the growth we've seen on the OTC side of things. So really it's the full section of counterparties, it's the variety of needs they have, whether it's positioning, treasury management, hedging, passing through flow. Um, and these days, much more demand for derivatives as well. So number one, the credit provision, number two, OTC. And then the third bucket really is investing through our VC arm. So, I mean, actually, this pillar uh, actually extends like way beyond investing. It's probably better categorized as support for the, the ecosystem. So we do this through events, we do this through advice, partnerships, of course, investing as well. But we're also incubating teams and projects. Uh, the first one to go public there is Bebop, which is the deck that we incubated. Really like anything that we think can help better uh, a decentralized world, we want to be in the room in some capacity. So to give you an example there, like we're very active in governance. We're a full-time delegate for some of the largest protocols. We're aiming to kind of give recommendations and input on long-term value adding and decision making as well. So we really get in the weeds. So three core pillars of Winspeed liquidity provision, OTC trading and ecosystem growth is probably the best way to describe it. I like it. A lot of irons in the fire. A lot to discuss here on the show today. Before we get into that, I, I have to know, what are the origins of the name Wintermute? Where does that stem from? <laughs> the culture of Wintermute is um, uh, it, there's a lot of gaming. It's very academic. It's very math-based. The name Wintermute comes from, uh, from a book. So uh, our... Founder and CEO of Genie uh, saw the name of the book and uh, and liked the name given the mass connotations and the fact that the ethos of the Winsby team is very um, uh, statistical based. All right, I like it. Let's get into all this fun. You mentioned uh, you provide liquidity on a lot of different uh, venues, OTC and of course uh, centralized. We talk about a lot of those different uh, venues here on the network. Let's let's start on the centralized side over there on CME. I know you guys have made some forays. 
into uh, CME recently. Are you guys making markets in the options exclusively? Are you supporting all of the crypto products there? What are you guys doing with CME right now? So starting with uh, CME options, so we had the announcement um, last week that we're now able to price and trade CME options. Um, it's a big milestone for us. Clearly, CME is probably the most trusted exchange brand in crypto, given its trad by history and presence. So really, the, the move for Winsmute to enter the space is actually a, a big reflection of um, our response to TradFi institutional demand that we're that we're seeing as well. So we have lots of TradFi players coming to us with requests, product requests, things they want us to be able to do, and to be able to offer and uh, trade and price CME options was, uh, was top of their list. So uh, it's kind of a reflection of who, the, who we're dealing with and where the market's going, um, and allows us to trade in a way that a lot of these more TradFi names are, are accustomed to. Um, also, I think for, for Winsmith, it's a major milestone because trading on CME um, requires you to clear through an authorized clearing member. So we're using AB and AMRO. Um, they're one of the leaders in the space. And from a reputational perspective, like that provides extra comfort to a lot of additional counterparties, given the rigorous DD process that firms like ABN um, require you to go through. So only a handful of crypto, crypto, crypto native firms have been able to to do that. So yeah, so it's been a, it's been a big achievement, a long time coming, and um, yeah, we're excited to, um, to to take it forward. We talk, obviously, about all the crypto options activity and, indeed, all the options activity going up on CME every week on This Week in Futures Options Program listeners. So if you're not checking that out, if you're just listening to the crypto rundown, you're missing out on a lot, including us touching on some other crypto options activity over there at CME. Speaking of the activity there, Willis, I'm curious for you, when when CME first got into this game back in 2017, a lot of people were excited for a variety of reasons. You just mentioned, you know, they are one of the big names in the world of derivatives, so they add a little bit of their imprimatur to what was kind of viewed as a bit of a Wild West market at the time. They started with the big futures and then, of course, eventually got into the options and the micro-sized products. A lot of people thought these things maybe were going to fly off the shelves. It really has been a little bit more of a slow slog in terms of the volume uptake, even with the micro size products, which were created to be a little bit more retail friendly. We've seen fits and starts in the volume out there, but no real explosion like a lot of people anticipated. I'm curious for your perspective. Sounds like you're new to the CME game, so you may have an interesting outside perspective to it. But, but I'm, I'm curious for you, why do you think these these products have struggled to resonate and gain some traction over the last, let's say, five years? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the reality is, is that whilst lots of traditional finance-focused uh, entities have been exploring crypto, the real volume in the crypto space has still, for the last few years, come from more crypto-native teams. So whether that is crypto VCs, whether that is crypto-native hedge funds, if you look at the if you look at the options um, market specifically, you see huge demand from crypto treasuries looking for yield. You look, you've got crypto native hedge funds looking for exposure. You've got miners and validators looking for smooth flow of future awards. You've got other brokers looking for liquidity. So all of these names that I mentioned are really the kind of core sources of flow for crypto options um, over the last few years. Now, the biggest hurdle they have is something I just touched on earlier, where to trade on CME, you need to go through an authorized clearing member. And actually, for a lot of those names I just touched on, that's just not viable. So whilst there was no doubt that the product was probably more robust and it came from like a more trusted name, the fact is that most of the entities that were the drivers of flow in the crypto ecosystem, especially for options, weren't able to access the products. So I don't think it's like a... It's not uh, an issue with the products. It's more the hurdle to get to those products. But what we're seeing now is the fact that you're seeing these, the volume on these products grow and grow. It's showing you the shift between historically who was the driver of flow and who are the new drivers of flow. And those new drivers of flow is definitely starting to shift towards the more traditional um, trad by focus hedge funds that have access to, to CME. Funny you mentioned that because that's been one, something we touched on uh, on this show ever since its inception, which is... That Venn diagram, the overlap, the intersection between the traditional markets of, let's say, a CME centrally cleared, and then, of course, the DeFi world, which is where a lot of our listeners come from. A lot of, as you mentioned, the options flow comes from the DeFi space and the centrally cleared space. They don't really 
they don't really see eye to eye on many things. And so the intersection there is something that we've been always fascinated by and kind of the, the pushing and pulling between those two worlds at the same time. I'm curious for you, Willis, you guys over there, Wintermute, as you mentioned, you have kind of feet in both camps. How do we bridge this divide? How do we get, as you mentioned, some of the flow providers to maybe start trusting or have access to centrally cleared uh, type markets? And maybe on the flip side, some of the more traditional players, large funds who are used to and maybe trust only centrally cleared markets, how do we get them to maybe dip their toes into the DeFi waters? How do we, how do we bridge this chasm, Willis? <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, it's a difficult bridge to chasm, and lots of people have been trying to do it for for uh, for a number of years. Um, KYC is a huge thing. There's lots of people looking to solve that problem right now. Um, there are entities um, and trading firms that trade on CME that would probably really like to be able to access options um, that are trading on DEXs or in DeFi, for example, but they just don't have clearance to be able to trade. Uh, in an arena where there is this thing lack of KYC. So there's lots of different L2s launching at the moment or different solutions that um, provide a KYC um, a KYC environment for them to trade. Um, I also think liquidity is a huge thing. So those that actually can put these, put these products, uh, the fact is, especially in DeFi option vaults and certain DeFi option products, there hasn't been the liquidity to date to make it appealing. And what you've then tended to see is people go back and focus on those, uh, go back and focus on essentially uh, cleared um, products. So talking CME or Deribit, um, they're the two, they're the two major ones. But there, but there are others as well, and that's actually something I think will be a huge development over the next few years. Is we'll start to see more and more centralised exchanges look to grow and develop their their options products and entice this type of flow um, away from the incumbents. And we mentioned, you know, the big centrally cleared player, CME is one of them. Back in 2017, another big uh, options player, SIBO, also got into the crypto game with a listed futures product. It was a very different approach. They were going uh, the one multiplier versus CME, which had five. So they're obviously going for a, a much bigger product targeted more at institutions. Uh, the SIBO offering targeted more at a smaller, maybe even a retail a type client so that ended up going the way of the dodo. SIBO got out of the space. We just heard just a couple of weeks ago a CBOE reversing that and planning to get back in with a new a new future coming, I believe, in early to mid January. So uh, maybe shaking up the game a little bit. I'm curious from your perspective, Willis. What are your thoughts on SIBO launching and then getting out, and then now finally years later dipping their toes back in the crypto waters? <laughs> I think the thing is that that's just entirely representative of what you've seen from a number of um, institutional tradfi firms over the last few years. You had this huge build-up of crypto in the prior bull run up, to, up through 2021, um, and everyone and anyone was starting to look at how they could um, be involved in the space. And then clearly, unfortunately, there were a number of very, very serious negative headlines um, and developments in the space uh, in 2023 and 2022. Um, and that caused a lot of um, institutional type folks to sit up and step back and think, hang on, we just need to see how this plays out before we fully commit. Because for these guys as well, there's another element to this, which is they've worked incredibly hard to build up their reputation uh, and their trust in traditional markets. Their uh, C-suite would probably be very nervous and quite understandably about piling into a crypto uh, environment and having that potentially compromised. So we've seen so many players uh, go through the same process internally where there was a huge ramp up, lots of thinking about how they could be involved in the space, a massive pause and pullback, and now they're starting to, to re-engage. And I think what you're seeing with Servo is just a, a, uh, a real reflection of that. But any type of better regulated more transparent trading venue that we can get in crypto like we're where it wins me we're all for now you mentioned the institutional side of the space that's something else we've been discussing and analyzing and debating ever since this show launched which is really what is the institutional demand for crypto it does seem like it ebbs and flows kind of with the crypto tide uh, i've often joked on this show maybe only half joked willis that institutions when crypto or in bitcoin in particular is below 30k 
maybe they don't really care so much. When it's back above 30K, it seems like a viable asset again. All of a sudden, all the institutions want in. Like I mentioned, Willis, it's a joke, but maybe only half of a joke. <laughs> is it really that simple at the end of the day? Are they just looking where the rising tide is of Bitcoin and that's the level of institutional demand? I'm curious from your perspective. Obviously, you engage with that side of the business day to day. A, what are you <laughs> seeing right now from an institutional demand? And B, is it really that simple? They're really just kind of watching the level of Bitcoin and that's when they decide they want to be part of it again. Well, institutional demand is, is an interesting topic because there are always institutions in the space, probably just depending on a load of factors, how crypto native those institutions are at any one time. So when price action is dull, there is like you call it like Bitcoin below 30K, for example, vols low, there's regulatory overhang, there's things going on, you know, you have stuff with FTX. That the shift of the institutional involvement then goes way towards the crypto native end of the scale. And then when you've got a bit more regulatory clarity, you've got uh, interesting price action, pick up and vol, then that's when you start to shift back towards the other inspection where you see uh, more trad by type institutional players enter the space. I mean, we're fortunate in our seat. Like, we speak to nearly all of the big institutional players in the space across that full spectrum. So from crypto native hedge funds and small teams through to investment banks and sovereign wealth funds and everything and everything in between. Um, there, is, uh, there were a lot of them that, as I mentioned, were very active or were ramping up, building out the infrastructure, conducting their due diligence in 2021, had to put things on pause during 2022. Uh, I still speak to these guys regularly. Uh, the really interesting thing is it's only an incredibly small number of them that have shelved it completely. Nearly all of them are either running it in much reduced size or they're just keeping it in the back burner to basically re-enter space when there is some type of certainty, interest, opportunity, whatever it may be. It's a culmination of all these things. But that's actually, I think, where, where you can't underestimate the power of, you know, people reference it all the time. It's like the most talked about talks in crypto right now. But if you look at the, the power of you know, a potential flat rock ETF, for, for example, all of these guys are having conversations with. It's not just the potential inflow that this could cause, but it's the institutional stamp of approval that having someone like BlackRock in the space gives, that gives these guys the green light to enter the space. So, yeah, for sure, they, everyone has their different metrics of what they're looking at before they re-enter, um, but it would typically be a combination of price, volatility, opportunity, regulation, um, clarity, um, and uh, a combination of all. So that's... Um, that's kind of the way I think about it. Yeah, certainly a lot of people very, uh, very excited about the prospect of that ETF, hence that, uh, that rising tide lifting all boats that we were just talking about there. You mentioned kind of the institutional firms and, and how they approach this. You guys have an interesting viewpoint on this over there at Wintermute. You kind of get to watch the whole, the whole life cycle of the onboarding of these firms and, and luring them to the dark side of crypto, if you will. So really quickly, walk our listeners through that if you can. The life cycle of onboarding and one of these firms, they come to you, maybe they're a little bit intrigued by uh, crypto options, and then and then take us from there, Willis. Yeah, so, I mean, we're uh, um, uh, approved by the FCA for uh, the UK regulator for um, AML and KYC, so typically we would um, go through that onboarding process um, with all of our institutional counterparties. I think something that's really interesting is if we think about the typical life cycle of, a, of an institutional fund specifically with with options before they get to the onboarding stage where they're trading bilaterally i think number one is they tend to start and i've seen this with a, with a number of different names they start to explore the space their first port of call is where they already have access where they trust the most they start with teaming then if they're looking to trade uh, slightly different contracts, looking for slightly improved liquidity, um, there's a whole host of reasons that they start to get comfort with Deribit and trading on screen with Deribit because that is predominantly where most of the crypto options liquidity is and has the highest crypto option volume. Then uh, you, if you're trading on screen with Deribit and you start to ramp up your size, you start to realize pretty quickly that there's some pretty aggressive slippage that you can incur. And so there's a platform called Paradigm, which is like the uh, premier block trading platform for executing big blocks with 
uh, directly with liquidity providers and then having them booked there a bit. And so they start to move to Paradigm. Then when you're trading on Paradigm, people start to figure out who they're trading with, uh, bilateral relationships are formed, conversations start happening. And then some of these uh, institutional firms start moving towards bilateral OTC options trading. And the reason why they eventually wind up there is because when you're trading OTC options on a bilateral basis, you can be, or Winston, you can be a liquidity provider in this instance, bespoke with all of the different um, contract components that go in. So clearly with uh, listed options, you're restricted to the particular contracts that are trading on the exchange. Um, but fundamentally, the biggest restriction is you're restricted to Bitcoin and ETH, for example. Whereas if you trade bilateral OTC options, Wintermute, we can price options um, much further down the curve in terms of the more esoteric altcoins as well. So that tends to be the steps that we see some institutional players go through. And then, of course, when they get to the bilateral OTC stage, that's when they go through the full onboarding and everything is negotiated and traded under, under an Insta. You mentioned the OTC side. Obviously, when you're talking OTC, the, the first and primary concern for everybody is counterparty risk. When you're talking about OTC crypto, it's double that. People are very concerned about their counterparty still being there when the trade comes due. So I'm curious for you guys over there at Wintermute, how do you assuage those fears? How do you overcome those concerns and get people, as you mentioned, in that life cycle to eventually progress to the OTC side? Yeah, I- I think we just accept and are very willing as a firm to be incredibly open with um, any requests that come through from counterparties that are looking to trade with us. So if people want to um, exchange balance sheets, conduct some credit CD on us, uh, need us to on board, that's something that we're that we're very willing to, to, to go through. Um, there are also different products and solutions now that are helping to mitigate um, counterparty risk in the OTC trading world. For example, using a third-party custodian to hold collateral is much more commonplace now than it, than it used to be. Um, but we're also developing products and improvements internally that can help um, reduce the concern of counterparty risk. So, for example, for our OTC trading, we've, we, we've been working really hard on introducing a new dynamic margining um, methodology. So the whole idea behind this is it reduces the initial capital outlay that uh, counterparties have to place with us. It allows multiple types of collateral. It allows the netting and offsetting of positions, and it allows you to trade altcoins, for example, sometimes without posting 100% collateral. So clearly, there's an element of uh, showing the credit robustness of Wintermute. There's an element of looking at what external products we can use to mitigate counterparty risk. And there's also an element of what can we do internally if clients are posting collateral with us. That means that that number of collateral is reduced, but we're still happy from a, from a risk perspective. Let's talk about some products, in particular Solana. You know, that was starting to get hot this time last year. Then, of course, we all know what happened a year ago. FTX kind of cut the legs out of many things, much of the crypto market, including Solana. Seemed like Solana might be on death's door, was dwindling, got down around $10, if not below. It was hanging out around 20 not too long ago. Then, of course, all this rising tide of the crypto space as a result of the ETF rumors have really lifted everything, including Solana. Solana just racing north of $50 now. So starting to get inquiries again from our listeners about maybe is it time to start talking about Solana options again on the show? So I'll put it to you out there, Willis. Is there interest again in Solana as an options vehicle, or is it really at this point just just too damaged by FTX to kind of go back to those waters? No, absolutely. We're, seeing, we're definitely seeing uh, renewed interest in uh, options uh, on Solana. Uh, it's one that we've traded a decent chunk of as well, um, especially in the last couple of weeks. I think Solana were, were uh, maybe fortunate or clever, I'm not sure, maybe a bit of both, that the Solana conference uh, held in Amsterdam this year uh, timed nicely with the start of the most recent mini crypto bull run. And the clear conferences, you've got lots of uh, announcement partnerships, um, things to get people hyped up, so that certainly helped. But there's also there's still a lot of love for Solana in the in the crypto ecosystem. I, there's people who I think felt like they'd missed the boat with Ethereum and Bitcoin to get in really early, and Solana for a lot of those folks gave them a second bite of the cherry. And um, because of that, I think it will be 
uh, there's always like a fun towards Solana, uh, even if it doesn't always come through on crypto Twitter. But definitely the people that we speak to, there is. Uh, and there's a number of VCs actually that we that we speak to on a regular basis that are heavily vested into the Solana ecosystem, and they start to track or look to track slightly more interesting metrics than just the price, for example. They look at the developer numbers um, uh, currently in Solana, and they're saying that things are looking positive and certain things have taken a turn in the last month or so. So, yeah, I, I, you know, the price action is clearly uh, good in terms of enticing flow and getting people back into trading it. But from our perspective, on a fundamental basis, we're seeing really positive things quite about Solana. And then from a flow perspective, we're seeing um, more and more requests to trade Solana options as well. There you go, Matt, to start incorporating Solana back into the show there, list It requires a good source of data on Solana. Those are becoming fewer and farther between, but uh, maybe we can investigate that for future episodes of the show. Speaking of the show, unfortunately, Willis, we've only really scratched the surface, but we have to keep on rolling with the show. But before we get on out of here, I know you guys and gals over there at Wintermute have a lot of interesting things up your sleeve. So before we head on into the Bitcoin breakdown, uh, leave us with some optimism, some uh, something we can anticipate, leave our listeners with a glimpse into uh, what they can look forward to from you and the team over there at Winter Mute in the coming months. Yeah, so uh, options and derivatives are traded from our Winter Mute Asia uh, entity. So Winter Mute Asia will be looking to build out um, a number of new products, some of which are already in, in the works, especially with on the derivative side of things. Um, with uh, OTC options, we're going to be looking to be adding um, more and more tokens um, to cover the kind of wider requests that we're getting through. Um, we're also working very hard on that um, ecosystem support side of the business, so more initiatives for builders um, uh, and events for people to come through, bringing people together to help push the space forward. Um, and we're still looking to hire good people in the space as well. And Willis, if folks want to see all these initiatives unfolding for themselves, check out what you and the team are working on over there at Wintermute. Where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, you can go to our website, wintermute.com, uh, uh, or you can check out our, uh, our Twitter, which is at Wintermute, um, or our CEO uh, is always good value on Twitter as well, um, and really insightful insights. Uh, that's a good boy. Well, Willis, I appreciate you taking some time to chat with our listeners here on the Crypto Rundown. We'll make sure to keep an eye on all these initiatives and maybe have you guys come back on in the coming months so we could see how all of this is unfolding in the marketplace, Willis. Perfect. Sounds good. Thanks so much for having me. appreciate it. All right, listeners, now it's time for us to keep on rolling. It is time for the Bitcoin Breakdown. It's time to explore the latest trending activity, trends, and developments across the world's leading crypto market. It's time for... The Bitcoin Breakdown. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Bitcoin Breakdown, the portion of the show where we do just that. We break down all the action in the world's leading digital asset. We're talking about the big dog, which is Bitcoin. Still looking pretty big, if, if not a little bit smaller than it was this time. Last week on our last show, Bitcoin was hanging out 37,665. Coming into the start of the show today, 3751. So shedding a little over 600, about 614 handles net from show to show. Of course, we had a truncated trading week here in the U.S. So a lot of the players in crypto trading might have been on hiatus towards the second part of last week. So market's a little bit thin, even though obviously the global crypto markets keep trading 24-7 out there. The high did come in that thin period, that thin market on Friday. We hit 38, almost 38.5, about 38,000. 415. Uh, the low coming, heading into the holiday on Wednesday, 35,671. So a pretty decent range on the week, which is also probably why, even though we were heading into a holiday and now coming out of it, it's usually a bit of a quiet period. The vol still managing to tread water right now. We got about a 53 in the seven day vol in Bitcoin last week, 52.8. So almost exactly that same level. Uh, coming into the start of the show this week. By the way, of course, all this data coming at you, courtesy of our friends over there at Amber Data. Kick the tires for yourselves, amberdata.io, the place to go to check out all this data and quite literally a metric ton more. If data had a weight, it would crush you. There's so much there. <laughs> uh, we really just scratched the surface of it here on the show. Let's go out to a more standard metric. Let's look at the one-month, the 30-day vol out there in Bitcoin out there on Deribit. On our last show, is that about a 48? So retreating back off the highs that hit 
in the mid to high 50s, but obviously also well off the lows it hit not too long ago as well in the mid to high 20s. Uh, This show coming in a little bit at about a 44.3, so coming in almost four points on the week. If we go farther out, six months down the chain, out to the 180-day vol, you're looking at about almost exactly a 60 on the show last week, 60.1 this week, 58 and three quarters. So still frothy, still optimistic, still juicy, but coming in a little bit out there. Let's go to the skew and see what secrets the skew has hidden for us this week. Let's start on the weekly and work our way out as we are wont to do. Uh, the seven-day skew was pretty optimistic last week. It was a positive eight. Remember, that's the difference in the volatility levels, listeners, between the 25 Delta call and the 25 Delta put. If all of that is voodoo, if that all that is Greek or nonsense to you, then, hey, check out our educational content here on the network. It'll help you make sense of all this jargon we're throwing at you here. Seven-day skew, still looking positive, still looking upside bias, but a little bit less so this week. Coming in almost three points, about five and a quarter. Right now, let's go out to the monthly, and last week, also, that was pretty biased to the upside. Almost a 6, 5.9. This week, about 4.6, so coming in about 1.3 points. Still, again, upside biased, but a little bit less so this week. Let's go out six months. You know, if you get a little bit longer term, that's where the holdlers tend to kick in. That's where you get to have a little bit more upside bias, and that tends to be the case again this week. It was almost, not quite a 10, about a 9.1 to the positive side last week, this week, about eight and a quarter. So coming in almost a point there as well. What is really coming in though, is the OI kind of across the board on Dara, but uh, let's start obviously in the Bitcoin realm and about 221,000 contracts open on the call side. That's down nearly 40,000 contracts, about 39,000 from this time last week, the puts 91,000 It's down about 29,000 from this time last week. So as we said, kind of light thin markets right now, not a ton of volume hitting the tape, as is expected for this time of year. Bitto, as is following the trend, giving up a little bit of the ghost this week as well at about an 18 and a half. Puts it down about half a point. Uh, in terms of ADB, it's at about a 60K right now. So that's up about 3,000. So continuing to grow, even though it was a quiet holiday week last week, which is impressive. Again, roughly two thirds of what it was this time a year, year and change ago when it was threatening a hundred K around 90 odd thousand contracts a day. And certainly much better than the 14 to 18 that it was hanging out at not too long ago. Again, going back to my old adage, when Bitcoin's North of 30, 30 K at least, then uh, people tend to have an interest, not just in Bitcoin, but all of the ancillary products, including Bitto, hence the ADV starting to head back up today. It doesn't seem like we're going to hit it. We were at about, well, about 30,000, so we were about halfway there. Uh, not that much time left in the session, though, so it doesn't seem like we're going to uh, threaten that 60K today. Yeah, we're up to about 34,000 now as the show has progressed a little bit. Uh, the vol coming back in a little bit, down about a 57, down about four points, which puts it pretty much in line with what we're seeing out there on the Darabit front as well. In terms of top positions, it's still all upside all the time. It's still long-term call dominated. I've expressed my viewpoints in the past about the utility of buying long-term calls in a product like Bitto, where the dividend is so aggressive, it's going to really hurt the performance of those calls in the long run. But nonetheless, we still are seeing a lot of open interest in those. All of these are Jan of 2025, with the exception of one. I'll, I'll point it out to you when we get there. Let's do a quick top five, and then we'll move on into the Altcoin Universe listeners. Number five, 29,000 of the Jan 20s. Number four, 43,000 of the Jan 25s. Number three, 69,000 of the Jan 35s. Number two, our only Jan of 2024 position in this top five. It's 83,000 of the Jan 65 calls. Then we're going back long term again, 95,000 for number one of the Jan 2025 30 calls. So all of that, Jan of 2025, with the exception of the 65 calls, which are expiring. In January of next year, still... However you slice it, all upside biased all the time. Uh, Certainly the 20s looking the closest. (laughs) But then again, that gets back to that same issue we talked about before with the dividends. We won't debate that again here on the show. Instead, we'll keep on rolling to explore the altcoin universe. It's time to move beyond Bitcoin and find out what's moving the rest of the crypto marketplace. It's time to boldly venture into the altcoin universe. All right, listeners, Altcoin Universe time where we explore everything outside of the big dog, which is Bitcoin, except for right now when we're breaking down the top 10 from an overall market cap perspective. Kind of hard to avoid Bitcoin in that conversation. Uh, Number 10, once again, Tron holding down the bottom part, the entry point, if you will, 
of our top 10. About nine and a quarter billion worth of market cap. So obviously substantially higher than it was a few months ago, as we've seen this again, rising Bitcoin tide lift all of the rest of the crypto boats. So number nine, we got our old friend Doge still hanging out there. Death grip on the number nine slot. A little over 11, almost 11.1 billion worth of market cap. Number eight, it's Cardano, 13.3 billion. Number seven, the aforementioned Solana. We were just talking about that at 23, almost 23.1 billion worth of market cap. Number six, it's USD coin, 24 and a half billion. Number five, XRP, our old friend XRP, 32.3 billion. Can't maintain its upside struggles. I feel for you, all you XRP holders out there. Number four, BNB, 34.3 billion. Number three, it's Tether, 88.8 billion. Numero due, it's ETH, 241 and three quarters billion. And the number one, the big dog, about 725 billion. Billion worth of market cap. Let's get out to number two in market cap, number one in a lot of your hearts. It is ETH, just a little bit north of 2000 as we kicked off the show, 2011 to be precise. That puts us down about 35 handles from our level last week on the show. We were at about a 2046. Uh, the high came again on Friday in those kind of thin markets, 2132 to the upside. The low, we broke 2000 ever so briefly on Wednesday, 1933 to the dark side. So almost exactly a 200 handle range on the week, which is kind of interesting. Let's get out to the vol. Let's go out to the seven day vol first. Last week was pretty frothy at 55 on the weekly vol. Now again, take some of these weekly numbers with a grain of salt. I like to look more a little bit longer term, more on the monthly range or at least a couple of weeks, but everyone's got to play in the weeklies now. So we, we have to include these on the show here at about a 55 this time last week, almost Almost a 45, actually a little bit below a 45 this week, 44 and a half coming into the show. So down over 10, about 10 and a half points on the weekly seven day vol. 30 day vol also coming in, not quite as dramatic, but still coming in. 55 and a quarter on the show last week, 48 even this week. So coming in a little over seven handles on the 30 day vol. And going out six months, we are 61 on the show last week, 58.3 this week. So not quite three points on the six month term structure as well let's go out to the skew and last week again pretty biased to the upside 6.4 was the positive skew this time last week uh, this week the seven day skew 2.4 so coming in exactly four points still biased to the upside but much 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 lower than it was this time last week and of course go back a couple of weeks it was the bias was much stronger so biased to the upside but not quite as strong as it has been in recent weeks, so let's go out to the monthly skew. Last week, it was a positive five and a half. This week, positive two and a half. So giving up three points. Kind of the same story there. Bias to the upside, but perhaps not quite with as much conviction as it was a couple of weeks ago. And the six-month skew, kind of a different story here, which, again, is kind of interesting. That's why we go out a little bit longer term, kind of see what the hodlers are up to out there. And last week, the show, we had five and a half points worth of positive sentiment, positive upside bias, call it what you will, in the skew out there on Derry. But this week, increasing, seven and three quarters. So gaining two and a quarter vol points over the past week. So that's kind of interesting. All the near-dated skew coming in quite a bit. Longer term, not so much. Actually getting a little bit frothier. So kind of interesting, maybe showing us maybe there's some turbulent waters ahead, but a little bit longer term, a little bit smoother sailing out there so intriguing stuff out there in terms of oi eth taking it on the chin again this is usually a pretty quiet period out there Uh, we saw just a little over two about 2.05 million call options open on darabit coming into the start of the show puts it down three hundred and sixty thousand. of course we know eth whenever there's an expiration cycle approaching eth tends to get hit pretty hard Uh, we're not quite in the quarterlies yet it's usually the quarterlies that really dominate the OI, so when you know September and all those kind of quarterlies roll off the board, that really takes a huge hit on the OI. We're not quite there, but it still is a, a big downside move on the OI front. Just a little over 2 million contracts open on the call side. 720,000 puts open this week. That puts it down about 380,000 as well. So a lot of contracts coming off the calls and the puts this week. Let's run through some of the rest of the altcoin universe, and we'll get out of here for this week, listeners. Solana. This week, 54 and a half when we kicked off the show. That's down a little over three points from where it was this time last week, 57.60, down about 3.13 to be precise. XRP, like we said, struggling to maintain its upside. 
I had about a 60 when we kicked off the show. It was 62 cents last week, so giving up another two cents on the week. We all know the story, the saga that is XRP. I won't belabor it here, but a lot of people hoped when we had some of those rulings earlier this year that we saw XRP spiking into the 70-odd cent range that maybe that was the beginning of the upside trend that people have been holding XRP for for years now, since the start of the show, before that. And yet, yeah, it's it's just... Uh, it's just a, a long, sad tale here. Can't even get it in the U.S. for a lot of you out there. I know it's just, it's just a challenge for a lot of you. So hopefully we'll see some resolution on this front in some shape or form in the near future. Uh, good old Doge pretty much treading water this week. 7.9 cents last week, 7.8 cents uh, this week. Enough to keep its death grip on the number nine overall. Market cap spot Litecoin down about two and a half points. It was 68.65 Coming in to the start of our show, 71 and change on the show this time last week. So actually almost about three points uh, coming in on the week, 71, 61, and 68, 65 this week. So giving up a little bit of the ghost out there. A Cardano, 38.6 cents this week, 37.6 cents. So do the math, it's pretty easy, down about a cent out there. Polka dot 537 last week, 510 this week, down 27 cents. And everyone's favorite. Ye old Shiba Inu, it was a million zeros, 0.85 this week, 0.81. So giving up a little bit of the ghost. Unfortunately, no Shiba Lambos on the docket for you folks this week. All right, that is going to do it for the Crypto Rundown this week. I want to thank our guest, Willis Croft from Wintermute. Make sure to check them out at wintermute.com or on Twitter at wintermute underscore T the place to go to check out all that stuff we were talking about here and a whole bunch more. And of course, you know where to go to kick the tires and light the fires on all the data we crunched and quite a bit more that we didn't here on the show this week. Only one place to go. Amber data, A M B E R D A T A dot I O the place to go to check it all out for yourselves. Listeners that is going to do it for us on the crypto rundown today. It's also going to do it for us on the network today got a loaded week for you the coming up this week listeners first off we have the advisors option coming up tomorrow at 2 p.m that should be a fun one out there then followed hot on his heels for all you pro folks we got a pro q a with our buddy mr rich excel always up to some interesting stuff out there whether it's in futures options could be crypto options we shall see ag options you name it Uh, equity options. He trades it all. He's got always interesting strategies out there. So if you have questions about uh, all sorts of option strategies, including crypto, get them in for tomorrow's pro Q&A. Of course, you know where to go if you want to get access to that, theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. Then back throughout the rest of the week, including on Thursday for our This Week in Futures Options program. If you're listening to this, you should be checking out that show. We do touch on all the things we discussed with our guest Willis there in terms of the centralized crypto options on CME and a whole bunch more. That's on Thursday. And, of course, we're back again next Monday, another episode of the Crypto Rundown. Stay safe out there, everybody. The Crypto Rundown is brought to you by Amber Data. If you're entering the digital asset class, you'll need access to granular on-chain and market data from multiple venues to power research, trading, risk management, and compliance. Amber Data delivers comprehensive data and insights into blockchain networks, crypto markets, and decentralized finance, empowering financial institutions to apply traditional finance methods to digital assets. Amber Data eliminates the infrastructure setup, integration challenges, and maintenance headaches to access digital asset data, reducing cost and time to market to enter the digital asset class. Learn more and download their digital asset data guide at www.amberdata.io. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider.
Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, stocktwits.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. <laughs> 